So um, Cliff Adelman is no stranger to Oregon. I believe he was the reason why Oregon got both the win-win grant as well as the DQP. Although Adelman is most commonly recognized as a brilliant quantitative researcher with his multivariate analysis and a keen eye for technical detail, to me, his gift lies equally in his ability to make his work clear to his readers. Unveiling complicated concepts based on volumes of data with startling clarity and simplicity. Here is an excerpt for, from my introduction last year, and this is what I said. Cliff Adelman is a whirlwind of passion and says it as he sees it. His skills and interests are varied, but the one thing that is constant is his complete impatient presence, whether doing a regression analysis or reciting verbatim, why can't the English learn to speak? From the Pygmalion, playing jazz piano, or engaging in a vigorous debate on the merits of the DQP. So colleagues in Oregon, the two people responsible for funding the DQP in Oregon, Marcus Kolb and Cliff Adelman. Thank you. Is the clicker up there? It should be. Well, if it isn't, yes, it is. We get our, our, our signature up. We, we, Marcus and I are, are, are pretty practiced in passing back and forth microphones and clickers and et cetera when we do these presentations. Now, I want to go, before we begin, one step beyond where Carol just finished, and it's a little bit different, which is kind of explaining not only why you're here today, but why you're going to be where you're going to be six months from now, 11 months from now, 14 months from now, and three years, and maybe six years from now. It's two words. It's very simple. It's Sonia Christian. Now, let me tell you how, how those two words work, and that's the way you've got you to understand this. Uh, these two words work initially um, by, by, by coming together and having an epiphany. There's an epiphany that falls on those two words uh, of where we need to go. And step two, the, um, the, the epiphany is subject to intense scrutiny and research analysis until it becomes a set of pieces of a puzzle that have to be put together. And there's a meticulous putting together of this puzzle. And then once the puzzle is together, the next thing this, these two words do is to turn a little switch on the side from or, uh, ordinary to high test gasoline. Uh, and that's the next thing you have to know. As a matter of fact, they haven't made an octane high enough uh, to uh, yet vis-a-vis uh, -vis what you're going to see happen next. Once the gasoline is in there, um, these two words get into it a vehicle that some people describe as a tank. Um, and um, they, they get up there and they smile, and that's a smile that launched 2,000 ships, too, while you're at it. I didn't say 1,000, I said 2,000. And then that tank comes, heads out toward the goal of the epiphany, and Sonia turns around, and there are 400,000 people behind her in legions. So if you want to know the way this works and where you're going and why, uh, all I can say is there's a, there's a geographic and demographic entity in this country called California, and it doesn't know what it's in for yet. <laughs> but in Oregon, you do. So that's it. All right. Are we ready to go? Oh, God. We're not ready to go. We have to go back to the beginning. Thank you. Thank you. Huh. That's our conversation piece for today. That is, we're, the DQP, Marcus and I will probably agree, disagree, whatever. We're all part of a family in this that produced these things, um, as that we're in an infancy in DQP process, maybe a toddler stage. And the question is, how do you become an adult? And that's, an, and that's a question uh, for you. It's a challenge for you in particular because you're going to lead the way for a lot of other people, and we hope that they follow you. So let, let's just go through it quickly. Paul may have covered some of this. Where did the DQP come from? And I've got it in two parts, and then Marcus is going to tell you from Lumina's perspective where it goes, um, partly from listening to other nations. Um, 
they weren't very happy with the meaning of their credentials, and they've been working at this stuff a long, lot longer than we have, and in, and in different ways. Some of them did it better than others, and I'm claiming that we're going to do it better than anybody. Uh, and in fact, part of the reasons of what you just heard in the openness of our process, the iterative design that Lumina put into effect, um, we're going to clarify meanings that, that people didn't anticipate. But we, we tried out what other nations did in establishing reference points um, through the tuning process, which I'll get to, in specific disciplines, which is the way, by the way, a year ago, you responded as a, typically in terms of faculty and administrators. Wait a second. In, in material science, this doesn't work that way. In culinary arts, this doesn't work that way. And then you say, wait a minute, step back. Let's think about that, what you just said. And I particularly like the people in psychoceramics who said that. I'll let that go. We'll see how many crackpots there are in this room. All right. Ooh. If you can't laugh, this is not going to work. Um, okay. And, and then lastly is, you know, you, you have all these accountability statements that are made. And I love the form of what's a, somebody who's about to be a former president of the University of California system says, you want to know what we do? Here's 131 indicators. Now go away. That is not what we're doing in DQP. But that is normally what's done in response, in response to calls for accountability. So we're doing something else. And part two, just to see um, yeah, <laughs> where we're coming from, and I want to remind you, what's delightful, and this leads into Marcus, we don't have, thank God, a central ministry of education, even though I worked for one in this country for 27 years, and I can tell you, thank God you don't have it. Um, but we do have entrepreneurial visionary authorities who can do the leadership and provide creative leadership and that's right here and he's good this I told you this is leading into you right um, and the Lumina Foundation did this they took our analysis of the Bologna process I saved all the emails and it said so where do we start because we want to do something based on this and that's where uh, how you're getting to where you are today and something that was just emphasized they're committed to the big goal of 60% of whichever population, I'm not sure the denominator, I assume it's 25 to 34 year olds, but 60% of 25 to 34 year olds hold a high quality, uh, hold a post-secondary credential by 2025 and to which they add, oh, by the way, it's not gonna mean anything unless it's a high quality credential. So he's, they set this in motion and now he's gonna tell you about the motion. And then we'll go back to how you become an adult. Good morning, everybody. Yes, we're good. So uh, Cliff's right. And for those of you that aren't familiar with Lumina, I just wanted to say a few words about it and sort of what's driving this and then make a point, which for me has been part of the evolution of this work. Uh, you know, when we began, there's the big goal, or as we're calling it, goal 2025. You know, we threw this language out in 2008 and we made the foolish mistake of labeling it high quality degrees and credentials without having given a lot of thought to what we meant when we said it had high quality, right? Mm -hmm. So we immediately had to come back around and say, let's figure out what that means. And the, the way the foundation thinks about it uh, is really about student learning. If we're going to talk about quality of credentials. We ought to be talking about what students know and are able to do as a result of study. Uh, in any one of our institutions towards any sort of kind of credential. Now, Cliff's right, and we do have an ongoing feud around the actual statistical numbers here, but the 60% number represents about 23 million more degrees for our nation, over and above what we might otherwise produce. So if we just kept on the pathway we are now, by 2025, we'd be 23 million degrees short of this 60% number. Anybody know what the attainment number is right now, by the way? Take a guess. It's about 40, 41%. Okay, in that 25 to 34 category that Cliff talked about, right? So we have a long way to go. Now, you might intuitively say, okay, well, so how does this body of work that we're, that we're involved in here today um, and the much larger body of work that I'll talk about in a moment, how in the, how in the world does that really contribute to that 60%? And here's where my own thinking has sort of evolved and, and talking with other people, I know they're beginning to think similarly, and that is really coming to the realization <coughs> The idea that working on quality <coughs> in, in, in higher education is really about working <coughs> on completion in higher education. When you talk about the elements that we think about that are attendant to quality, things like transparency, things like the ability to take your learning to a variety of different places and have it recognized and accounted for, when you start to translate quality in those ways, you begin to see very quickly how that leads 
two more credentials. If we had a system where what a student is supposed to do when they arrive at our institutional doorstep, the things they're supposed to learn, how that learning will be assessed, if we made that more clear, all of these students that are joining us now, first generation students, students that don't have the cultural capital that perhaps many of us had when we came to higher ed to understand what's gonna happen while they're in the institution. If we could make that clear, those students are more likely to be successful. The research certainly suggests that. So by virtue of doing the work of the profile, by understanding what our degrees mean and then making that clear to others, we know this is gonna to lead to more completion, which is really why this is not about sort of a bifurcated, we're working on completion over here, we're working on quality over here, no. We're working on quality because we believe quality does lead to more completion. And I think, at least for me, that's a more evolved way of thinking about it. We're only a year or two ago, I would have said we're, we're working on two separate things. I think we're really working on the same. So there is a lot of work going on right now out there. Cliff is obviously going to focus on what you all are doing here as you've been doing for the last two days. Before I go any further, I have to really express my gratitude to you all and on behalf of the foundation, our gratitude for what you all are undertaking here. You represent a major step forward in this body of work, and Cliff is correct. This, uh, we would not argue about this point. This work is only just beginning, right? We get that you're not gonna change credentials overnight, or in three years, or in five years. In the foundation, I've argued this, this ought to be goal 2050, right? When 2025 arrives, we're gonna need something new to do, and this kind of work really ought to be what it is, right? Redefining a system of, of, of credentials in U.S. higher education. So. We are really at the beginning and you all are laying important groundwork in a unique way that no one else is doing. Now we have projects that are noted up there across a number of different places, right? So we see the regional accreditors as important stakeholders in these conversations because of how they're involved in making sure that your credentials are of quality, right? And of access to Title IV money and so forth. So we see them as crucial and they are often the place where when you start to think about student learning, what we learned from the Spellings Commission, for example, is many campuses aren't motivated to think about this question until accreditation rolls around, right? So it becomes important that the accreditors are part of the conversation. And then we have other organizations that are involved. We have AAC and U, obviously, who's leading work here in Oregon and seven other states to look at this around transfer, which is a popular way to consider this question. I know it's part of your challenge here, right? Is thinking about the implications of this for transfer and articulation. It's notable that among these projects where people tend to go are what we might call pain points, right? These are places that we know higher education struggles, and these are the places that people are finding the DQP to be valuable and something that they may want to work with. We could look across those other projects down there. The ASCU project, for example, is in three states. Some of that is around faculty engagement. Some of that is around transfer and articulation. The Council of Independent Colleges represent sort of 25 independent projects at small, private institutions all sort of trying their own thing from taking the DQP and applying it to a marketing program at a school in Wisconsin to looking at partnerships to looking at engagement with employers. We have some institutions in North Dakota who the first thing they did when they got their hands on the DQP was reach out to employers, the community colleges, and show it to them and say, is this the kind of learning you want from our graduates? And if it isn't, let's talk about what that ought to look like. And then let's talk about what that means for our curriculum. So we're finding there are many ways to approach this, and it raises many important questions that we really think are of value. And then we have you all in the equation, right? A unique opportunity to put this in place across a state where wherever a student is attending and wherever they might go in the state of Oregon, we're gonna have a room full of people led by you all right here who are going to be speaking the same language about student learning, who are gonna be able to talk to the student in ways that, oh yeah, I heard that at the other place I was at as they swirl and they go different places. And the story starts to sound the same for them no matter where they're at. And the power and the outcomes that are derived from that are crucial. And you're gonna help us figure it out. Now, the infancy piece is absolutely correct. So part of this absolutely is you all looking at the thing and saying, here's what works in here for me, and here's what doesn't. There will be a revision probably in the next 18 or 24 months. Probably not a major one, but a revision nonetheless. And we wanna know from you all what you think of the content, so that the revision can be as well informed as possible. And that is a big part of this. So whatever thoughts you're having, Sonia alluded to it at the beginning, about this throughout, right? Good, bad, enthusiastic, bored to death. We'd like to know, because it will inform and tell us how we can improve this thing, which ultimately ought to be owned by you. Okay, 
Thank you very much, Marcus. Now I'm going to get I'm going to get out of here so I can see what's on the board at the same time that we talk together. Um, as I said, we're talking about how to become an adult and in this business, and with Oregon's group as as a central focal point and fulcrum from all of this. Because when we get this list of people and, and organizations doing various things and understanding each one of them as a pick this up for a slightly different reason and sometimes completely different reasons, you can see some of the pitfalls and the promises when you look at that list of who's involved in DQP work right now. And this is one of the reasons I think we're doing it better given the complexity of our system than other countries did where they did it from the ministerial level down. Uh, at the present moment, and, I, and, I, and we did have some reference to that by Sonia this morning, is communication between projects. Right now, it's minimal which means that in, in, the, in the steps that becoming an adult involves, the more people that share what's going on in their projects, uh, the better off you, the information is. I learned yesterday in Oregon, I run this win-win project of which Oregon is one of nine states. I learned stuff yesterday from your people that are gonna, it's gonna go right out to the other eight states that, we ha that they hadn't brought up in their discussions, but you did. Um, I'm not gonna go through all of that, but, they were, but you had an awful lot of smart people in that room who saw things that other people didn't see. Then you've got uh, another, another pitfall and promise simultaneously are the different pulls on transfer, on what, th which means horizontal transfer as well as vertical transfer. We have a lot of both of them going on. Usually people think of transfer simply a vertical phenomenon. As you well know from your students in a highly mobile society, it ain't. You know, and you can start with the President of the United States who started in one school and finished in another, and the way we do graduate, gra uh, graduation statistics today, Barack Obama's not a college graduate. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm sure there are people who think so, but that's beside the point. You know, uh, after all, he's only a Kenyan herdsman, right? Um, but, I mean, the fact is that, that, that Occidental, where he started, gets, no, it gets penalized because he left them without a degree, and Columbia doesn't get credit because we don't count transfers in. And you can go lots of examples in your own families of horizontal transfer as well as vertical. So you've got pressures that are, um, you've got overlaps and you've got diagonal pressures in that area. Now, an issue that I thought you were going to raise yesterday, and I want to hear from the IT people on today, is record keeping in a competency-based system. I mean, there the people make gestures that way, but then you turn around and you say, now wait a second, what are you people doing to credits? I mean, that's our green eye shade boys in the back room, you know, and but, but, you, but you're pushing credits to the back in favor of competencies, or competencies are coming to the front. What's your record keeping system? You know who raised that question first? Won't surprise you at all, the registrars. Absolutely, right off the bat, the American Association of Collegiate Registrars, their convention two years ago when I broached, brought them the DQP. That's the, hello, how are we keeping records here? You know, and that's a challenge for you in Oregon as well. And because you're doing it together across the sectors of, of the system, you're going to be able to provide some hints. And I'd like to hear somebody address that issue today. I'll be going to some of your meetings. I'll bring it up again. All right, accreditation procedures and benchmarks. I mean, Marcus pointed to the different accrediting bodies that are in this ball game. WASC and, and, and HLC and, and the Southern Association, et cetera, and AACJC, they all have slightly different benchmarks. How do they relate to a DQP? I mean, they're, they're, they all, we've got to, I'm, I'm not gonna say they should do it the same way, but at least use the same language. In talking about it, you'll find convergence in time. And at best, formulaic encouragement from state authorities. This is where I would go to the state higher education executive officers who say today, oh, that's nice guys, keep on working at it. No, I want some of them to do what Oregon has done. And you're gonna set the example from some other, for some other states to get on the line and say, give us your, not merely your current plan, give us the way it played out over three or five years um, and we're gonna follow along. So we, we've got to get them beyond formula, encouragement um, uh, to, to um, uh, a action. And lastly, and I'm gonna address this in a moment, is massive, critical mass of participation that uh, something as comprehensive and as, as challenging as a DQP don't work unless you've got lots of faculty involvement. And I just don't mean, 
you know, casual involvement in one meeting. I mean people working on it. We're going to address in my remarks in a moment some ways to do that, and I want to hear more from you. Okay. You are the only project we've got right now. Marcus may disagree with me, but I'm going to say that. You're the only project we've got uh, that has the potential to overcome all of these pitfalls that are in there because you're statewide, because there's convergence between the two-year and four-year sectors, because you're talking to each other, because it's an iterative process, et cetera, and you're taking up these issues. Nobody else can do it in isolation. That's you. Okay. Here are the steps I think you get from adolescence to adulthood. And let's go over each one of these, and we want to hear questions about them. I want to make sure that each project's response includes, and I'm going to use the phrase, examples of assignments given by faculty in their courses that validate the competencies described. I don't care whether you're teaching um, uh, analytic chemistry or economic history or um, um, uh, cost accounting, you can, you can go down the list of what of a variety of, of, of topics that your faculty are teaching. All of them, and I'll come back to this, use today assignments and by assign, I'm not calling them assessments. Notice that I'm, I'm, I'm going to skip over that word. And I'm going to say they're assignments. They are exam questions. They are laboratory instructions or specs. They are exhibit instructions. They are performance um, outlines. They are field tests. They are a variety of things that you're doing um, that, they, that can, when you ask them, would you please look at what you're doing carefully and see how that, how that relates to uh, the, 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 competent, the various competences in the, uh, the degree qualifications profile. They're all doing that now. Make sure that every project's response includes those examples. And I'll come back to them. I'm going to hammer at that again before we're done. That's number one. Second, through those assignments, and it, you're reconciling the disciplinary specific or field specific pieces of the of people's responses to how this works works with the generic. That's where tuning comes into play. Well, what we call tuning, which is an international phenomenon that takes a discipline, we'll do it in a minute again, um, and says, okay, here we are in business administration. What is a template of reference points that any business administration program will cover? Just reference points. You know, uh, the concept of a firm is one I'll use. You can't have a business program unless you're talking about firms someplace. It's a question of how you do it and then spinning out from the template of reference points, student learning outcomes. What do you want to know? How do you define a firm? What do you want students to learn about firms, et cetera? And that is what I mean is it's the way you reconcile that response, which all faculty have. And I don't care if they're in culinary arts or business administration, or physics, or history, that's the kind of thing that they, they're going to ask. Um, how do I reconcile that to, to a generic degree qualification? Uh, d d generic degree qualifications. Then, the third point, when you get the examples of assignments from all over your faculty, what you've done is that you've, you're, you're, uh, you're moving toward critical mass. You're moving toward critical mass right away. Because I'm going to take the assignments that come from this table and I'm going to share them with others and we're going, to, we're going to do it in a very systematic way so that everybody sees what everybody else is doing and you'll get ideas. It happens. I can think of assignments I gave as a faculty member which I would put up on the table and George would tell me, now wait a minute Cliff, would you please rethink this one? Which of these competences do you think you're addressing here? Uh, I'll give you an example of one I did give, and I'd say, oh, my God, Clifford, what did you think you were doing? Um, you know, what, what were you asking the students? Why? The degree qualifications profile helps me answer those questions and to, to revise the, the assignment. Um, then the record-keeping system. Is this something I think we have to do in DQP, which I think you can do? And putting, and last but not least, is when you get done with an agreement on a consensus statement of here's the way we see in Oregon, see this, this degree qualifications profile. Right now I'm making this up. It's got 42 uh, competencies laid out. And the way you, re in five areas, and you might redo it in 39 competences of which 27 came from the original and 12 you added and they're in, not in five divisions, they're in six divisions. 
of the knowledge uh, universe and student development universe, you put that on the table, it's got to be out there for everybody to see it. <coughs> it's your statement <coughs> of what a degree qualifications profile is for a system. We're not doing that now, but to become an adult, that's where we got to go. All right, let's start with the assessment piece. We know why we've got active verbs in the degree qualifications profile. They lead directly to assessments. You don't have, we don't use dead end nouns. We don't use terms like awareness, and we don't use ability. We don't use appreciation. Those, if you try to write a student learning outcome statement with any of those things in there, you're going to wind up dead end in a wall. We use active verbs. Critical thinking, the mush term of all time. Tell me what a student does when they, they quote unquote critically think and you wind up using verbs. You say, this is what they do. This is the, here are the cognitive operations. Every one is, every piece is a verb. And if you give me the cognitive operation, I don't care if you're teaching analytic chemistry or music theory, you're going to come up with a direct assignment that comes out of that, whatever it happens to be. It could be a 12-tone composition. It could be a, an identification of uh, ferroliquids. It can be whatever it is. I just went back and forth. That's an interesting combination. Let's do music and chemistry together, and you actually can get, some, get an interesting tune. But you can't do that with a dead-end nouns. And as I point out to people, it takes place within your field. And faculty do a lot of it now, but they haven't reflected on why or how it's my point. When I sent them, uh, a group of people teaching a course in, we called it Metropolis's Artifact, it was basically urban history and urban visual history. And there was a lot of visual literacy in the, in, in the, in the, in the course. It was how to see the, the visual environment around you. I team taught it with an architectural historian. And we sent kids out with a map. And we said, OK, here's what we want you to identify in terms of connections between the changing shape of human settlements and changes in housing law and health care and health, public health law uh, in the 19th century in terms of what you're looking at. This could be done in a number of older cities. Can't be done in a rural area, but it can be done in older cities. You could do it. And I said, gee, that we were a smart boy. Was that clever? But then when you turn around and say, what are you asking for? What was the connection to a generic requirement for a degree? How much, and then you think about visual literacy, you think about blind students, what do you do instead for, uh, of that for, for students who are not, visual, uh, not visually capable, let alone those who are, who, uh, who, uh, who are visually limited? What is it that you want people to get out of this? How do you adjust the assignment to account for these things? And what are your, I mean, Terry would, would um, so no, no doubt endorse my next cri criteria. What are your rubrics for actually judging this thing? The writers of the DQP, of which I'm one, stayed away from grading. Grading is a, uh, or the question of how well a student does something. That's a faculty prerogative. We weren't going to stick our nose into it. But it is very possible in a DQP for somebody to make a decision that for this competence, I'll take as an example, identification and, and use of information resources, which is one of the competences we have now. We can define that at three levels, at the associate's level, and then at the bachelor's level, we can have, if you think of the continuum of mastery, you can start with the novice and go to the master. What is it? If you want to do it that way, that's up to you. We're not going to tell you how to do it, but put it on the table for everybody to see. And part of my point in all of this is that faculty themselves you know this, are treasure troves of these examples of assignments, and, and they're not assessments. They are assignments. They are built into courses, and the question is getting them connected to the competences more, more logically, and so you could shake your head. You, you don't even have to shake your head. Think about it twice. They're like, like, like windows. You look through them. I know what's on the other side of this one because you could see where it's going. So what I'm saying to you all is remember, without examples of these assignments, there's no DQP. There isn't. That's, that's our approach to this thing. All right, so let's think of what we got for feedback. Let me show you some of the feedback we got from presenting these things. Wow, the first one. You know where this one came from. Started at ETS. You know, I did a presentation for ETS staff. The first thing, how are these things going to be validated? You know, I mean, you've got all these faculty assignments. How do we know that they work? Well, I'll tell you, I don't, I'm not insisting, and I don't think you should be either, 
on the kind of, of structured validation of every single one of these things. You can find your own way of making these judgments. So let me illustrate. I'm a faculty member, and I'm teaching a course. Uh, and the, the number of courses I'm teaching, I'll, I'll put myself in music because I know a little bit about it. OK, so let's say I'm teaching music theory. I'm teaching um, uh, musicianship history, which means um, and of the pre-20th century. You know, I'm into, into history. And I'm doing um, uh, overseeing performance development uh, in stringed instruments. OK, let's say I'm doing those things. The first question you're going to ask me, look at the degree qualifications profile. Which of those competences do you cover in your courses? OK, there are 39 of them. I might only pick seven that I even address anywhere in, in my courses. And then for the, each of the seven, OK, what assignments do you give to Susie to see if she is a, a, a good fiddle player, you know, or if she can, she can tell you all about um, Berlioz's um, experimentation with requiem uh, forms, et cetera, et cetera, you know, in terms of musicianship and so forth down the line. What, do you, what assignments do I give in a variety of ways? And of course, you know, when people talk about, we, we all teach teamwork, right? You know, one of the best ways to teach teamwork, be in a music group, in a, a small ensemble, a large ensemble. It's like playing football, you know, it's the same kind of thing um, and where you have to, where everybody's got roles and, and they differ, et cetera, et cetera, and whatever. Then turn around and ask me again which of those competencies I address most frequently and which I think are most important. As a faculty member, I can do this within music. Am I contradicting the generic nature of a degree qualifications profile? Hell no. What I'm doing is illustrating it. This is the way it plays out in what I teach. And that's going to be true at every level, whether associates, bachelors, um, uh, or master's degrees, you can, it, and, and it is by field. So I'm, and so I'm asking, what? And don't pay attention so much, uh, slavishly to validation, but to, to to help the faculty member hone those assessment assignments, the prompts for them, clearly enough so that a student does what the student's supposed to do in order. Um, uh, to, uh, uh, for you to uh, judge whether they met the competence or not. Then here's another objection. What's to preclude uh, trade-offs among faculty, as in, I'll do this one if you do that one? Uh, you know, just think about that, because that's going to turn up. Uh, we had something like that in our win-win discussion yesterday about awarding degrees. When, when the student attends three institutions and one school says, that's my student, I want that one for performance funding. No, that's my student, I want that one for performance funding. You know, it's the same kind of issue. What's to prevent trade-offs? I'm not going to answer the question, I'm just reporting from the field. And they're asking whether, whether I could, if we had core competencies, 30, 39 of them, let's say, and then supplemental competencies, there are people who want to take up uh, ineffable characteristics like teamwork, or uh, ethical consciousness or whatever, and we can, you can bundle them under a supplemental set of competencies. Uh, can we do these things separately? That's for you to answer, not us. But we hope you do address those kinds of issues. And I, I describe, is there any way to describe levels of performance within competencies? And how is that different from grading? Think about it. We're just rating. These, this, these are smart people who raise these things on the outside, and then you've got Traditional approaches to assessment, oh, we'll give you the CLA. We'll give you the collegiate learning assessment, where you can prove that your effect size is bigger than Terry's effect size. I'm uh, sorry about that, Terry, but it, you know. And everybody's eyes will roll, but what is that kind of a, an assessment as opposed to the kind I just described to you, where faculty do it within their courses? Think about it. And that's that because the transformational nature of this degree qualifications profile is to focus on the individual faculty members' assessments. If they don't do it, then it's not owned by them, and they're not going to follow along. If you pass over the task of determining whether your students have met these markers to some external authority, you're taking it away from your faculty. Just think about that one. I wouldn't let that happen, but you, I mean, who knows? And so answer these questions. OK, so another point about the intersection of the generic nature of the DQP with, uh, with the discipline 
uh, uh, approach to student learning outcomes, there are really three points in the DQP in which these things cross. And I, th and I hope you appreciate that because you're going to be dealing with disciplinary faculty and, and their comments on this thing down the line. Number one, if I took each of the existing five territories of DQP, I could illustrate them on the, uh, with, with the variations that are on the assessment level. Every single one of them I could do that on. If I were a nurse, let, let's take that, that um, just a moment, that identification and use of, of information systems. I've got the nurses using the physician's desk reference. I've got the chemical information system. I've got historical records and different archives, et cetera, all of which cross the disciplines are used to illustrate that particular set of competencies. You could do it with other competencies, too. We don't have time to deal with all of them today, but I'm sure you will. Um, so that's one, one, one intersection. Second is in the examples of assignments. I just mentioned this, and I've hammered at it again, and I'll be redundant and hammer at it again, which you get from the faculty. And then there's a section of the DQP called specialized knowledge. So there are a very variety of approaches to this. Can you take this on in a broad area of the curriculum to illustrate, for example, in the social sciences? Is there something that we all agree on in the social sciences that constitute core learning outcomes and core competencies that, are, that can illustrate any of the social sciences? Well, I'm not sure about that. The economists will say that ain't the way. We don't deal with this the same way the political scientists do, but you never can tell. You might figure that out. That's a question. That's another area in which the knowledge and skills and reference points cross between the discipline and the generic. So think about that. And then what's called tuning is what comes into play, just in case you don't know what it's about, because it's another Marcus mentioned, and it's another major Lumina undertaking. It came from. It started on in, in Europe. It came under into the U.S. under, uh, and then it went to Latin America in 2005. It came to the U.S. under Lumina sponsorship in 2009. And now I'm working with a, a Japanese on this, which they, they were approaching it in a completely different way than everybody else does. But it's the same thing. It's ground up faculty determination of reference points for a discipline. Um, what happens? And yet they con consult with employers and and panels of recent graduates uh, who hold degrees in the field. Um, and Lumina started it. You can see where, where they began, Indiana, Minnesota, and Utah. And we've got Texas and Kentucky. This is not minor stuff. This is now not moving on in heavy directions. And each, in turn, brought in the flagship state university, other public four-year colleges. And unlike what people in other countries do, we had all the community colleges in there. So this was as much about the student preparing to major in chemistry in a community college as it was about a student pursuing a chemistry degree in a four-year institution. And where we had one of the most fascinating uh, cases in this was in Minnesota, where they chose graphic arts as one of their disciplines. And in the Minnesota system, Degrees in graphic arts are offered at the associate's, bachelor's, master's, and doctoral levels. You know, and so you could work up the line, ratchet up the levels of challenge, expand the level, the number of tools, et cetera, from, uh, in use in one level to the next, and understand what the differences are for students moving from one, one uh, degree level to the next. This is all within the disciplines, though, um, and it's really the first cousin of the DQP, and it's the, it's the, it's the approach from which the, the DQP sprang. If I could interject just one second, Please. speaking of celebrities that are here today, Krista Johns is sitting right over at that table there from ACCJC, and they are undertaking a project to look at how both the DQP and tuning intersect introduced simultaneously to faculty. So we are interested in this question, and we have somebody who's working on it uh, on our behalf right now, so I'm, thank you. I'm glad we have the, I'm glad we have the reinforcement. Uh, because that's the part of the message here, because it is going to be common to the discussion of a degree qualifications profile in no matter what environment it occurs. You've got to be dealing with the disciplinary level. How do you reconcile them? They are cousins. They're kissing cousins. So there's a question of, of, of how they, and, and there's a question of where you start, one to the other, or as, I don't know if I have that. Let me give you an example of what happened in the European Business Group, um, just, to, just to show you how they worked it out. And these things don't happen overnight. This is a group that worked on it for nine years, you know, to get a certain point. Now, they started with people, and they ain't got a problem we don't have. They're working in at least 10 languages, and sometimes 
20 when, they, when they're dealing with these things. Um, and in, in business, they agreed that the concept of a firm was core to any business administration program, and they defined a, 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 a firm, this was by consensus, 15 countries, 11, I mean, it was, uh, yeah, no, 15 universities, 11 countries, 10 languages, representatives agreed that a, biz, that a firm was a value chain. That's the way they described it, from procurement to customer service, and here are the stops in between, and that any business program worth its salt has to cover, we're not telling you how, but you have to cover those reference points if, if you're dealing with your students in business in a firm. From each one of the, once you've got a template of all of this, you could say, for each one of those, what are the student learning outcomes? And does that make the business program in Freiburg in Germany a carbon copy of the business program at Coimbra in Portugal? No, but it means that they have the same reference points. They're going to emphasize different things in different ways, and they're going to present them in different ways, but they've got all of that. They've got the specific skills and competences, and then they agreed, let's sort them out. Let's have core knowledge, supporting knowledge, and communication skills, and what do we recommend for emphases. Does that mean they're going to be followed out? No, they're not going to be followed out, but if everybody's at least touching base with the same kind of concepts of judging the quality of their programs and the clarity of their programs. And the bottom line is you get something called convergence, not a straitjacket. It means that if I get a business, I don't know if I did this, if I didn't, uh -huh. okay, hang on. If I did this in such a way, I, I graduate in business administration from Freiburg and another one from Coimbra, if they applied for a job with the Deutsche Bank in Bonn, their degrees would be understood. I mean, the, the reference points would be understood. If they applied for admission to an MBA program in Birmingham, their degrees would be understood. That's the challenge they faced, people coming from different countries, speaking different languages, et cetera. Uh, obviously, the Deutsche Bank would require German as a, as a language, and Birmingham, you'd have to do it in English. So what? But that's part of the issue they face. Something parallel goes on here, minus the language issue, to be sure, and the borders between states, are, in case you haven't recognized, are not nuclear zones. There are some people who evidently think they are. But uh, that, that we have to deal with here. Then what, another one it was what happened, I mentioned the graphic arts in Minnesota, but another one was in, uh, uh, in Indiana, and, they, and do I do that? Okay. In Indiana, with it, in chemistry, the tuning faculty in Indiana mapped out 36 competencies in, in, in chemistry at the bachelor's level, and they realized that 26 of them also applied at the associate's level. They said, wait a minute, how can you do that? What's the difference? They looked at him carefully and they said, challenge level. So they rewrote the competency so there was a distinct level of challenge, a, a, a ratcheting up of challenge from the associate to the bachelor's level. I could illustrate that with a chemical information system. What do you expect an associate's degree student to be able to do and know about and do with the chemical information system? What do you expect a bachelor's degree student to be able to do? There is a difference. You back off and you say, wait a second, there's a generic form underneath that statement. And the generic form goes back to what we've got written in the, in the DQP with identification and use of information systems. All right. So here's some other things you've got to, got to come up with. I know we have a transfer project, for example. Um, let's say the sending institution's got a transfer, got a DQP and the receiving institution doesn't, or one way or, the, or vice versa. What do you do about it? This is, you've got to address this as, uh, or, or the whole DQP process has to address this as in the process of becoming an adult. Second, personality, values, and, a and attitude change. That's the kind of issue I illustrated with core competencies and supplementary competencies. Well, how do you get them in there? Can they be part of it? And if so, how? Uh, sustainability. What kind of reinforcements and mechanics do you need to keep a DQP going? So, you know, that kind of, these kinds of questions you've got to deal with. Think about adults who are coming back to school, we got under legacy assumptions. All of a sudden, instead of your credits, we're asking you for competence. Well, how do you handle that? Uh, please think about it as you grow up, from, as, you, as you move from adult, uh, adolescence to adulthood. Uh, we also had a question, uh, Marcus and I have talked about this and uh, the other writers too. How many versions of DQP are we gonna get? 
from all of this process. We get 491 versions, you got degree anarchy. So what is it that you can, what, how do you shape these versions so you don't get degree anarchy? But uh, what I'm saying to all of you today and in my conclusion to this message, you've got a multi-year march ahead of you, a real multi-year march. And if you look at what other countries have done, you'll see that it took them a long time to do it. And they had ministries that dictated a lot of this stuff. We don't. We're building from the ground up. And that's why you in Oregon have the chance to lead everybody else. Because you've got all of these questions together across the entire state system at the same time. And some very smart leadership, huh? I got two of them at this table. And one of them who started it all. And so, and all of you out there who will contribute to this. And it's a movement, again, of growing up. And it takes us, in case you haven't noticed, a long time to grow up, doesn't it? Thank you. That's it. Questions. We got lots of questions in. Feel free to ask both of us. And if there are no questions, you know what that means? That means we were so good we shut you up. That's impossible. Go ahead. Thanks. Brian Green at, uh, from Columbia Gorge. Um, a few slides back, you had a the list of the percentages for the different areas and it's that the business people set up in right, Europe. that it, was an example right 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 and it said that it intentionally didn't add up to a hundred yes uh, but it wasn't even close to a hundred so what's supposed to happen with it the balance about that, 80 or 90 I thought you, okay so yeah, what whatever it was it was left open to the schools to say what they wanted to put in I mean I could say I you know it, some things you know you have a school that in which in your history department happens to have the guy who wrote the fundamental textbook in Chinese history that's used in 46, 4,600 colleges and community colleges or whatever. And therefore, your program has everybody studying East Asian history. Of course, you're taking advantage of your faculty member. And because of that, they're not studying something else. So you know, it, it, the, the programs will vary by faculty expertise. But what we're asking, that specific East Asian, what competence is that what competence is it covered in that course what's it what are they related to in terms of the of the dqp and i think that you can answer that question even with a faculty expertise that is weighted heavily toward east asian history as opposed to latin american history as opposed to u.s constitutional history depending on who you have yeah and i would add to that you know i think one of the fundamental I don't want to say misconception, but we hear a lot about you're standardizing the credential, right? You're making everybody sort of teach and do the same thing. And I, you know, sort of the, the way I would respond to that is part of this work is identifying what's unique about your institution, right? So we are talking about these are the common things that we want students to know and be able to do across degree levels. But by virtue of that space that Cliff left there, this is to talk about what we do differently than the place down the street, right? Because part of the, part of the mapping exercise, and if you go so far as to place your institution on the spider web diagram and look at its shape is to say, well, we're better in these areas and we can market our institution about being better in these areas or we're unique in these areas and no one else does this, which is that space. And this is, so this is not an exercise just in saying, what do we, what ought we have in common? This is also an exercise to say, what do we do best as an institution? And what would we say to students about why they should come here as opposed to going to the place down the street or across the country, and I think it, it, it can cut in both directions. Well, why they should come here, other than the fact that we have a nursing program and the next nearest nursing program is 200 miles away, or we've got the, we've got the performing arts program with, with the music corps, you know, that's hot, and, um, and, the next, and nobody else in the state system has it. That stuff is fine. That's called institutional differentiation, but it's not degree level. Uh, a generic degree level competencies. Every, uh, I can write, you can write competencies that are as common for, this, for the school with a big nursing operation as the school with a performing arts operation. So, I mean, that's the point of, of what DQP works on. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Hi there. I you think. don't remember I think me. I know you, Judy. Yeah, I'm Judith from Judy. Right. <laughs> I want to pick up on the top line over there on the Oregon DQP. One of the really interesting questions is how you build on general education with 
in the context of the discipline, rather than seeing it as a separate component of the curriculum that, quote, you have to get past. And I'm interested in what you're learning out there about whether it's ratcheting up or it's further sophistication in these core ways of understanding and using knowledge within music or chemistry. Okay, um, let's see if I heard you correctly, Judy. Um, a lot of schools, Marcus, you can probably speak to this too, because some of the institutions that are participating in the HLC project or in the CIC project are, are, have, have taken to focusing on what they call general education, as opposed to degree qualifications profile, which is very different than general education. We're not confining something to what people say is the first two years of college or to a core curriculum that everybody has got to do. It's everything we're doing. So, you know, but if a, if a school choose to do it that way, the luminal process, of, you know, when you tell me if I'm right or wrong about this, the iterative process says that's okay. If you're using this to explore what you call general education, which is confined to a core or uh, of coursework, or you know, which is, don't ask me about to go into that one, uh, but a core of coursework or what students are supposed to have covered by the time they're rising juniors. If that's what you want to do with this, fine. But that's, you know, I'd say, I'd say but that's not really what it's about. It's really because, because that will not get you from the associates to the bachelor's to the master's degree level. And the reason we chose three levels and not one or two was, you know, in part looking at what other countries did, some of them did five levels, some of them did everything from kindergarten to PhD, and saying, now wait a second, that's going to confuse that devil out of everybody in this country. Where can we focus so that we can ask the following question? I get bachelor's degrees. How is my bachelor's degree different from Green Tree Community College associate's degree down the road? How is it different from the master's degree I give in the same field? Excuse me, have you ever thought about that? Have you, those of us who went from bachelor's to master's degrees in the same field, did, was, the, was the master's degree um, uh, uh, curriculum challenge, assignments, et cetera, really a ratcheting up from what we've done at the bachelor's level? Or in some respects, was it a ratcheting down? You know, but the reason we, we did through those three levels was to make sure that people thought about the master's degree a lot more thoroughly than they had in the past and not merely, oh, let's just assume we have a bunch of bachelor's degree students, we'll teach the same topics, uh, but with a different emphasis. Oh, I can roll my uh, eyes with that one. I would add just two, yeah, two pieces to, to that. Please. I think applying it to general education makes sense in many ways. I think there, the pra there's a practical reality, and many of you in this room probably know this well, right? We to rely on general education as sort of the primer for the skills in the major does not recognize the course taking patterns that I think most students are engaged in, right? Which is the overwhelming majority of our students are not taking two years of general education and then proceeding into their major, right? They are taking some courses in gen ed, some courses in the major, and some of them are opting to hold off their gen ed until the end because they sense they have better opportunity to get the courses they want and so forth. So, it's difficult to sort of start and say the gen ed will lay all these pieces and then the major will capitalize on them. Um, in fact, I mean, I, my own experience as an academic advisor tells me that part of the reason the system isn't working for many of our students is they want to study engineering and there isn't any engineering in their first year coursework. We're pushing them into gen ed and we're pushing them into doing their calculus and no one's connecting for them how this adds up to the credential, right? So there is a real challenge in saying, we can't really control in which order students might take these courses or experience these competencies. So how can we align them so no matter what order they sort of encounter them or choose to consume them, we are still moving them forward in terms of the development of their competencies. And I, I mean, I, I don't have an answer, but I think a lot of the work that you all will be doing will help us sort of flesh that challenge out. And the writers, the writers did not consider general education as an organizing principle at all in this. We just focused on the competencies and the levels of the competencies. Where you do it within your school is up to you. But, you know, some people have taken that as a sign, uh, let's work on what we call gen ed and forget everything else. And we're saying that's a, the writers did not make that assumption. I'm not going to tell you that's a mistake. I'm not going to prejudge you. But the writers didn't make that assumption. Yes, ma'am. 
So uh, this is um, Stephanie Don from Oregon State. Um, I actually have just more of a, a compliment and a, and a comment than a question, but I, I want to thank you for really illustrating and, and emphasizing the point um, about it being owned by the faculty and, and demonstrating how that can be done. Because I think that it can be very easy, particularly for large institutions, to want to fall back on um, you know, some variation on the theme of a standardized test or you know, some meta something that's way out here. And it really does then remove it from um, it, where it should be. And it also can take away from the, the sense of ownership and, and power that is really important for a faculty-run um, institution. So I just want to thank you, and I feel like that that's a take-home message that um, would be important, um, at least from the, the cultural perspective of, of, of OSU, to emphasize and demonstrate and, and do. So thank you for that. Thank you, Stephanie. I want to add to that, you know, because I think it's really important. That means for leadership, you know, if you're, if you're talking about deans being involved, the CAOs being involved, they've got to be fluent in more disciplines than the ones that they came out of. Because they've got to be able to go from, you know, what it is that we do in music composition to what is it that we do in culinary arts, in um, historical, uh, let's say, historical um, uh, cuisine, you know, or what we do in engineering with, with spectacular spectac spectroscopy, you know, in various ways. You know, you've got to be able to go from one to the other and know what it is so that you understand and can illustrate with faculty assignments, with their prods, with the field work, with the, you know, what would I do with color theory? I think in the fine arts, what do I do with color theory? I can ask you a question on a test. I can ask you to, I can give you exhibit instructions to, that you illustrate various aspects of color theory. You know, I can ask you to I deal with a, uh, I give you a field work assignment where you're going to go out and illustrate colors and do some photography and bring it back and write a narrative with it. There are a variety of things. A dean has to be able to know that stuff and, be, and communicate with faculty and say, hey, this is your work. And if your work ain't in there, this is not going to go. We got a question over here. Or oh, you did. Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Bill Bogley. I'm Director of Academic Programs Assessment and Accreditation at OSU. And I'm really glad to hear that Stephanie feels so reassured about, what, uh, about the way this is developing right now, because I feel a tremendous amount of uncertainty. And I want to express the challenge that I'm feeling by, from the DQP right now, which, which I think is one of essentially trying to integrate the experiences that students have in their major with what they experience in their general education, and I would also want to encompass what they experience in the co-curriculum. I think all of those things have essential roles to play in helping the students achieve the elements of the degree qualification profile. And so the challenge that I feel in that context is that trying to integrate across those three different sectors of the student experience presents a fundamental challenge to the governance and organization structures of the university. Certainly, Orienting myself to the essential learning outcomes and the, uh, and the competencies and the degree qualifications profile has affected what I do in the classroom. I talk about calculus in a different way than I used to. I'm also a math professor. And in a way that I feel really comfortable with and I think is meaningful to my students. But the challenge of taking my perspective, say, as director of assessment and taking it into the department meeting in the math department and encouraging all of my colleagues there to embrace this very encompassing viewpoint of the student experience. And then sitting as director of assessment of academic programs and trying to promote integration across these three pieces of the university that have very disparate governance structures and accountabilities within the university strikes me as a fundamental challenge that I'm uncertain about how to okay. approach. So, you know, I, I would say, Go ahead. In quick response to that, right, you, you, you're, dr you're drilling right at the core of what this is about, right? If there's one takeaway that I would want people to have, what this is at its essence is this is the uh, development and agreement upon a common language that institutions can agree upon, that folks within institutions can agree upon, and then we can trade upon. So in order to integrate those three elements of the institution that you're talking about, first we must agree about what it is that we're talking about. And so the work that's being done around the profile here, 
the, the sense that we want back from you exactly what you think about it and how it can be used and how it can be made better and how it should be edited is in fact efforts towards finally getting at that common language that then allows you to move into those three different roles and say, okay, at least we're all talking about the same thing now. Now we can move into the idea of how we can do it better, how we can do it differently, how we can account for it, and so forth. But common language is really at, its, at sort of the most base level of what this is all about here and arriving at what that common language ought to look like around student learning. I would just say one other thing, and what I heard you, heard you saying, if, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that when you overlay governance structure on substance, things change. And that, I have a problem with that concept um, in light of what the DQP is trying to do. To, to, for, from the point of view of, of writing and getting convergence on an on, on agreement on student out, learning outcomes and competencies, govern, to me, governance structure is, irre, is irrelevant. Now, then I can see where your attention comes from. Because some people think, I've been involved in faculty governance structures, but you know, they, they, they usually wind up quarreling about other things, not about uh, concepts underlying student learning. Um, but that's, you know, everybody will come at this a different way. And that's, I can see where you're coming from, but it's, you know, to me, it, it doesn't fly. That's the, all. I mean, the long-term thing here is, and I'll say this as a former residence life guy, right? I'll argue that there were some things that happened in, in my department that had real value towards the educational experience. There's no way that's accounted for in our degree system right now, right? We, we don't talk about it. We don't give credit for students for doing and learning things while they're living <coughs> on campus, while they're in leadership roles that we frankly should be accommodating for, right? We should be accounting for those things. So when it comes to the challenge that you're talking about, I think to me, the beauty of all this is it starts to throw the doors open wider and say to the entire institution, everybody here is making a contribution to the constitution of this credential for this student. Let's just make sure that all those people are in the conversation, and then again, let's make sure that we agree upon what it is that we're talking about. So I'd like to think, again, this is goal 2050, I'd like to think that we're talking about learning coming from all directions in the institution, and not just the place where we sort of leave it sit traditionally. And so these are infancy steps towards sort of figuring that out. Yeah. I'm Donna Evans from Eastern Oregon University. Um, you mentioned in your presentation uh, that tuning was one of the things that we would be looking at. And you, you mentioned their origins and also that the European business group definition of firm um, was value chain, which results in procurement. Well, it just illustrate that's an, yeah, illustration an illustration of what tuning group will do. Right, so there's an illustration there. And from that illustration, uh, reference points could be drawn so that we would have an idea within education what needs to happen in my, what I understood is we would draw reference points from that illustration um, that every, every program would emphasize certain things, but then um, we would have differences, things that we expand on that we emphasize uh, more greatly. The question I have is where do those reference points come from? Do they arise in the faculty, the administration, or from outside sources like corporations and businesses? They're all fa faculty generated. The reference point templates are faculty generated by faculty in the field. They will consult with, this is the way the Europeans have done it. We've, we've got some variations on this. They did surveys of employers and surveys of, of, of alumni to ask questions such as, what of your learning was most valuable to you in your subsequent uh, occupations? Okay, or ask employers, given all of our graduates in, um, um, uh, let's say in, in uh, uh, biological, medical biology, you know, biological medicine, or, or whatever. But given all those graduates, which, which are the skills and knowledges that you find most valuable? You know, um, and that as input, but the ultimate decisions as to what was in a reference template, reference point template were faculty decisions. From that, and this is where they weren't so good, and where our tuning people have trouble too, writing student learning outcomes from the reference points. They were very, they had, they had learning outcomes that weren't really outcome statements. They had, they had those that, was, that were redundant. They were, they were statements of the obvious, like a student who masters this field will be ready to study the next level up. No kidding. You know, you know it's that kind of a statement that you know, they had those, I could, I, I, in my study of the Bologna process where I would devote a large chunk of it to tuning, I give you some examples of the kinds of silliness. And they had an external evaluator from the Netherlands, an organization come in and they, 
that evaluator beat the dickens out of them for bad learning outcome writing in nursing, in economics, in history, and, and in one other field. Um, but then you turn around some good examples of student learning outcome writing uh, in their, this is true in their, in their systems across 30, 40 countries. The music conservatories are a distinct, very distinct and far more visible group of institutions in Europe than they are here. Okay, so they all got together in an, in an, out, in an operation called Project Polyphonia. They rewrote music curriculum, did student learning outcomes, and curricular adjustments in lots of places so that people could be on comparable ground. They wrote some darn good learning outcomes, um, you know, and very good, very well phrased uh, uh, across, down the line. Uh, we have the similar problem. I've looked at and reviewed all the tuning st statements that have been finished in the U.S., uh, and some of them I would send back. I'm not in the position to do that, and I'd send it back, and I'd sit down and say, hey, folks, you're using the word ability here for these things. Ability ought to be a red flag. Ability is you ought to tell you right away. It's not something innate you're dealing with, you know, and you'll can take all kinds of flack for that. It's what Stephanie actually does, not her ability. It's her performance that counts. So forget that. Just say that this is what the person, in any event, there are lots of better ways to do uh, learning outcome statements than what we've read where people struggle with it. It's not easy. You have to get used to the, the language, the verbs, the et cetera. So, and that's part of this game. So, um, it's not a game. Sorry, I got to take that back. I'm, that's an unfortunate term. So we write. probably Go have ahead. time for one more question, but All I right, wanted to come back to the point the boss that, has told us that, that, that we have one more. Yeah, that um, you, you were making Bob Bill, Bill from uh, OSU. And in my perspective, this particular project in Oregon is going to be successful if we can address the issue of an institution taking collective responsibility for student learning, collective responsibility towards the degree. So yes, it is important that we uh, gain skills in articulating learning outcomes well. Yes, it is important that we collect assignments that are directly connected to the competencies. Yes, it is important for us to have conversations about what ratcheting up means. And all that is important and is articulated in the grant. But the cultural shift that, is, that needs to occur within OSU, within Lane Community College, within the University of Oregon, where we are moving beyond discipline conversations, where we're looking at students, you know, getting those outcomes for a particular course or within the discipline to outside as a collective. So faculty, as well as our student affairs colleagues coming together and really looking at what does, how do we collectively ensure that the competencies are realized at a degree at Oregon State. And, and I think you hit the nail on the head that, that, that if we can start moving towards getting that cultural shift happening within the three years of the grant, I would say we have really moved hugely in, in this particular work. So with that, I think we could take one more question. We're beyond our time uh, for Cliff Adelman and Marcus Cole before we wrap up our plenary session. Hi, I'm John Knutson Martin from uh, Eastern Oregon University. And this question, I wish I would have had a chance to ask like yesterday at the beginning of the program. And <clears throat> I don't know what the Lumina Foundation is. I look up and I see that the Lumina Foundation was a conversion foundation created in mid 2000s as a US group, uh, the nation's largest guarantor of student loans, sold its assets away. So I see where your money came from, which was almost a billion dollars. So Whenever I go to one of these meetings and people are telling me stuff that needs to change at my school, I'm wondering what their qualifications are. And I like what I'm hearing, but I'd, I'd like to know how Lumina became the leader in this. I don't know that I have a good answer for that. Uh, John, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't know that I have a good answer for that part, John. So I've been there about four years. You're right, the place is now about 12 years old. 
you're right that it, it's, the, it's the largest private foundation in the U.S. whose only work is in access and success in higher education. That's all the work that we do, um, is trying to get more students into and graduated from higher education. Focus primarily on underrepresented students, so we, that is where we spend a lot of our time, and that definition is expanding, right? So we're talking about returning adults now. We're talking about the kinds of populations that we sort of refer to as 21st century students. You're right about the origins of the endowment, right? It was the sale of USA Group, which split into two. Part became USA Funds. The other part was the endowment to fund the foundation. Um, the endowment hovers somewhere around a billion dollars. We probably do about $50 million a year in grant making. It's evolved. Uh, I think at the beginning, I'll be critical of my own organization, I think a lot of the funding went to sort of boutique -y little, here's a cool project over here that affected 30 students, and here's a cool idea over here that affected 50, and here's a small research question we'd really like to answer. Um, and then we got a CEO in 2008, Jamie Marisotis, who came from IHEP, um, who saw, had a bigger vision and put the big goal out there, or goal 2025, and said this is where we ought to be focused, this is what we ought to be doing is working towards getting more credentials, this, this so-called completion agenda that you've heard a, a lot about from a lot of different places, right? President Obama talked about it in his, in, in, in his uh, State of the Union in 2009 after taking office. You hear about it from other foundations. Um, you hear about it here in what's going on with Complete College America across the states, right? Folks are more interested in seeing more folks with credentials because we get that the impact that has for the individual and for our economy and for the future of the country. Um, where does the expertise come from? Um, a lot of it's bought. We pay him, right? Um, whether or not you like him or believe him, we pay him, okay? We pay people like Paul Gaston, who was here yesterday. There are other people in this room that we have paid for some of their expertise, the AAC and you folks in this room, right? So we try and find the people that we think um, know some things, and we try and get them to apply their knowledge. Somewhere along the way now, the foundation has also taken on a thought leadership role. I will not say that I am an expert in higher education. I think I know something about higher education. We have ideas, we test them with other people, and then we put them out in the field and see if they have value. So um, I would not hold the foundation out as experts in this area, but I think we're willing to experiment. And I think we're willing to pay for some other people who we perceive as intelligent to experiment. And that's about as far as I could go in terms of the expertise of the foundation. Is that helpful? It is. Is there any connection between the Illumina Foundation and the continuation of selling student loans? None whatsoever. And that is a popular misnomer, and often when the foundation is criticized either for the work or the foundation itself, it is that there is some back behind the scenes agenda about student loans. The answer is categorically no. We are endowed. Our money sits there. It came from that sale 12 years ago. No one puts any more money in the pot right now from any direction. We are doing what we're doing for the betterment of the field, at least in our estimation. Compared to other foundations, compared to other foundations, they've got a consistent vision. I won't name the foundations that change what they think they're doing every other week, but there, we got plenty of those. Lumina doesn't do that. Yeah, we have arguments with them, but it's a, they're family arguments, and, they're, and they're, if they're food fights, we're, they're, we're food fights. But, but at least they, rec and they also recognize the value of knowledge and research, you know, that's not loaded one way or another, that there are truly open questions that have to be addressed. And we would, I won't get into one of them that we've been, Marcus and I have been talking about, but I can tell you that your colleagues upstairs yesterday in the Win Win Project raised a lot of fascinating angles on this particular question. And that's going back to Lumina too. And they're open to exploring this stuff. You know, unlike Yeah, the job of a foundation ought to be to make, to experiment and we, we can make mistakes and there won't be consequences, right? So we're gonna make some bad decisions, we're gonna make some good ones, but um, there is no other agenda and I truly appreciate you asking the question. Well, thank you Cliff and Marcus, great having you here and we go into... Thank you.